Father, we love you, Lord. We, uh, we are always grateful to gather in your house, Lord God, in your name. Uh, Lord, I thank you for all those tuning in online, Lord God, desiring that you would meet with us this morning. Father, help us understand, Lord God, as we celebrate being with you, Lord God, as we, again, part- celebrate the Lord's Day, uh, that this is more than just some religious experience. I pray we would never look at this as just a routine of what we do every week, Lord God, that, but we would understand you desire to meet with your people, that you desire to speak to our hearts, that we would know you more, that we would grow in our understanding of you, that we could apply the truths of your word to our heart. And so, Lord, let that happen today, Lord God. Let us come with anticipation, wanting to hear from our God, Lord God, that you would speak to us and tell us what we need to know personally. And so have your way, Lord. We love you, Lord. We humble ourselves before you, and we invite your presence, Lord God. We ask that your Holy Spirit would take your word and cause it to become alive in our hearts. And so be glorified today, Lord God. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Good to see you this morning. Let's turn our Bibles back to the book of Romans. We start a new chapter this morning, Romans chapter 5, okay? Romans chapter 5 this morning. If you're not already there, I hope you guys brought your Bibles. Hope you brought a pen. Again, I want you to take some good notes this morning. And as you begin, as we begin, I'm going to begin with a verse that hopefully all of us know. Hopefully, by this time, all of us have memorized, okay? How many of us, again, have by heart John 3.16, okay? This is one we should, right? There are awesome, so many, you know, key verses in God's Word that we should know and we should memorize, but this is one, again, one of the most important of all. The Lord Jesus, again, summarized the gospel message in John 3.16. For God so loved the the world that He gave his, His only begotten Son, His only Son, His one and only Son, that whoever, whoever, Believes in, in who? Who's the him? Jesus. Whoever believes in Jesus. That means whoever believes in who he is. He is the son of God and he is God the son. And believes in what he did. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross. He was buried and he rose again on the third day. Whoever believes in him will not perish in hell, but have what? But have everlasting life. Or the Bible, your Bible might say eternal life. Every Christian should know this verse. Every Christian, again, should have memorized this verse so that we know it by heart. We understand what, how Jesus explained the gospel. But the reason I bring it up this morning is this question. Jesus spoke of everlasting life or eternal life. But when does that begin? When does eternal life begin? When does everlasting life begin in the life of a believer? Do you know that question? Do you know that answer? Every Christian, again, as much as understanding the gospel is important, no doubt, we need to know about eternal life. We need to know when that eternal life begins. And so do you know the answer to that question? Because you need to. Every Christian should. Now, many people erroneously think that eternal life begins the day we die or the day that Jesus comes to rapture us. But do you understand from a biblical standpoint, eternal life begins the day we become saved? Okay, That day, that very day, that might have been 20 years for you, or that might be today. But that is when eternal life begins. Now, when we speak of eternal life, eternal life speaks of two things. If you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, eternal life speaks of a quantity of time. Okay, Very important. Eternal life, forever living, right? Living for or in eternity. And so number one, whenever we read about everlasting life or eternal life, it speaks of a quantity of time. But how many of you understand that even those who do not possess eternal life also experience a quantity of time? Even those that die in their sin without Jesus are going to live forever. Does that make sense? And so understand, when we read about eternal life, it is a quantity of time living forever, but it's more than that. 
And specifically what it is, it's not just a quantity of time, it's a quality of life. Write that down. A quality of life. This is what eternal life means. It means experiencing a life with God, fellowshipping with God, and enjoying the blessings that come with it. But along with that, one of the amazing things that hopefully we've all experienced is that living for Jesus gives purpose for life. It's purpose. It's meaningful. So many people, sadly, again, in this world, it's so sad when you read about statistics of how many young people today are committing suicide. And it is so sad. But if you teach people, again, that they came from monkeys... If you teach people that life is an accident, that life is random, then life has no purpose, right? It's just an accident. But when you understand that you were made in the image of God, that God saved you for a purpose, He gave you eternal life, life takes on a new meaning. Life is now meaningful. It now becomes worthwhile. And that's what God gives us. He gives us not only life, but a more abundant life. Someone say amen? That's what the Bible teaches. And so it's so important that we understand what eternal life is all about. But let me ask you this question. Are you experiencing a quality of life today? Are you experiencing eternal life today? Because every Christian should, remember, it should have already begun the day you confessed Christ. Christ. But one of the sad things, and I just have to be honest with you, one of the sad things that I have found in talking to different people, people that come to church, again, people that claim to be Christian, is that they are not living a satisfied life. They are not living a fulfilled life, and essentially they are bored in the Lord. Have you ever heard about that? Their life is unfulfilling. Yeah, they're coming to church. Yeah, they're, you know what I mean? They're, they're, they call themselves Christians, but it's just, they're just not feeling it. They're wondering if this is all there is. Is this what Christianity is all about? And it's so sad because I can tell you over the years how many people I've seen walk in and out those doors. How many people I've talked to over the years that have told me, yeah, I tried Jesus. Have you heard that before? I've tried Jesus as if Jesus is like a coat you just put on in the wintertime when it's cold, right? But that's so sad because they tell me they've tried Jesus, but because it wasn't what they thought it would be. What did they do? They went right back into the world, and they're back in the world today, and it's so sad. But do you understand if that has taken place, all that means is that they never had eternal life. And do you understand that eternal life is forever? And so if you only had it for a little while while you put Jesus on, then that means it was never eternal after all. Understand that as a Christian, God desires that you experience a fulfilled life, that you truly have a life worth living. How many of us at one time, again, were looking for fulfillment, looking for satisfaction in the things of this world? Was that you? Because I know that was me. I wasn't raised in the church. And 33 years ago, next month, I gave my life to Jesus, right? Has my life been perfect? Far from it. Do I still have struggles and trials and difficulties? Do I still mess up every single day? But you know what? I'll never trade the life that God has given me for anything in this world right? For anything in this world, God is good. And God gives purpose. God gives meaning. God, again, you know, we're able to experience His his presence. Yes, we go through difficulties, but you know what? He'll never leave us nor forsake us. We never walk alone. This is what eternal life is all about. And so let me ask you one more time before we begin this morning, are you experiencing this eternal life? Are you living a life that is fulfilled, not perfect, but fulfilled, a life of meaning, a life of blessing as a child of God, because this is God's intention for you? Sadly, there are many Christians that are not experiencing eternal life. 
They're looking forward to maybe dying one day and experiencing eternal life, but they're missing out on the life that God has for them to live today. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning, okay? A very important message as we come to Romans chapter 5. But as I always do, let me back up, right? I got to make sure everybody understands what we've covered. If you've been with us, over the first four chapters of Romans, again, we've uncovered, we've uncovered so many amazing things in the first four chapters. But let me quickly, in, a, in a five minutes, recap the first four chapters with five key lessons. Okay, very important. I want to make sure you understand what you should know thus far. Number one, Paul declared that God is righteous. Someone say amen, right? Everything God does is right. He's perfect. He always has been. And Paul said in Romans 1.17, For in the gospel, the righteousness of God, that means the fact that God is right and that the righteousness that we need comes from God, is in the gospel. The gospel reveals that righteousness is from faith to faith. Very, very important. Remember, the word righteous simply means the state or condition of perfectly conforming to God's holiness. Okay? God is righteous. Everything he does has always been right. And the gospel reveals that to us. Number one, God is righteous. But number two, the whole world is unrighteous. The whole world is guilty, right? None of us meet God's standard. We are all sinners. And Paul said, again, Romans 3, 9 and 10, for we have already charged, we've already established that all, that everybody, whether they're Jews or Greeks, remember, whether they're Jews or Gentiles, are under sin. Every single one of us are born under sin. That means that we are born with a fallen, sinful nature that is under the power, the dominion, and control of sin. And in case we doubt that, all we have to do is look at our life before Jesus, right? We could not stop sinning if we tried. We were slaves to sin without the help of the Holy Spirit because being born with a fallen, sinful nature. And so number one, God is righteous. And number two, we could say we're not, right? We are all unrighteous. What's number three? Number three is that no one can save themselves. Despite what religion teaches us, any religion you pick, none of us could ever live up to our religion. We could never be perfect in obeying the rules of doing this or not doing that. Why? Because we're all sinners. And that's what Paul declared. Romans 3.20, For by works of the law, by trying to obey the law, no human being will be justified. The word justified means declared right before God. No human being will ever be declared right before God in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. The law reveals to us that we're sinners, right? Every time we drive down the freeway and the speed limit says 65 and all of a sudden we look and we're going 70, we realize we're breaking the law. That's the purpose of the law, to show us we are sinners. God is righteous, we're not. We can never be righteous by obeying the law. And so number four is salvation is by grace through faith. Because we could never be good enough and earn our way to heaven... God had to give us salvation. It is simply God's grace. The word grace, grace simply means gift. It's the gift of God that is received through faith. Romans 3, 21 and 22. But now, now that Jesus came, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from trying to obey the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ for all, for everyone who believes. Very, very important, right? The Jews had always believed that they earn being right with God through behaving. Paul says, no, it is not through behaving. It's always been through believing, okay? It's always been through believing. It is through faith that we receive righteousness by grace, right? That's good news. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. It is simply something received by God's grace, which brings us to number five, which is the way it's always been, okay? The Jews said, no, no, no. Uh, 
Paul, even if you're right, even if in the New Testament we receive righteousness by faith, in the Old Testament they always tried to obey the law. And Paul said, that's not the way it has always been. And remember, in that same verse, Paul said, by now, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although, he says, the law of Moses and the prophets bore witness to it. They testified, even in the Old Testament, all of the sacrifices in the books of Moses pointed to the Lamb of God who was to come and take away the sins of the world. All the Old Testament prophets prophesied of the Messiah who was to come, right? To provide salvation for us all. It's always been that way. This was always the plan of God. And if you were with us last week, or we covered, as we covered chapter 4, he used Abraham as an illustration. Remember that? That even Abraham received righteousness of God through his faith. And so, this is where we pick up where we left off. Having established this, right? That we are made righteous by grace through faith. That's good news. Right? We can be saved. We can be delivered from God's judgment. We don't have to die in our sins. We can have, right, something to look forward to. And that's good news. We would say amen to that. But that's the future, right? Heaven's the future. Make sense? What about today? What about today? Is there anything that Christians can experience today in their relationship with God? How many of you understand God has blessings for us today? And every single Christian should be, and I say should be because I don't believe every Christian does, experience these blessings in their life. God has blessings for us. But are we enjoying these blessings? Part of the reasons we might not enjoy the blessings is we don't know what they are. Now Paul, in Ephesians 1.3, said... Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. What blessings is he talking about? What spiritual blessings should every believer be experiencing today and not waiting for eternal life to begin when they die or when Jesus raptures us home? This is what we're going to be looking at in our text this morning. As we pick up where we left off, we begin chapter 5. We're going to look at the benefits of righteousness, okay? The benefits of being made right with God. We're going to cover the first 11 verses of chapter 5. We're going to look at the blessings, again, that all believers can experience. And blessing number one, write this down. I hope you're taking notes this morning, is peace with God, okay? Peace with God. Let's begin again. New chapter, chapter 5 this morning, verse 1. Therefore. Now always remember when we come to the word therefore. What does therefore mean? Real simple. Because of what I just said. That's what it means. Because of what I just said. Paul has established in the first four chapters, right, that we can be made right with God through faith. It's good news. Now what? Well, therefore. Keep reading. Since we have been... Underline have been. Notice it's in the past tense. We have been justified by faith. Now let me ask you, who is Paul writing the letter to? He is writing the letter to Christians in Rome. Are you guys with me? Have these Christians in Rome already put their faith in Jesus? Yes. They are already saved. They have already been justified. The word justified means declared right before God. And he's telling them, since we have already been declared right before God, notice, by faith, not by works, that means something, okay? He's establishing the fact that we're already saved. We're already justified. No, I love this. I love the fact that it is in the past tense because Paul is establishing that if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus, it's a done deal. Does that make sense? Do you understand how good that is? How awesome that news is? When God declares you right before Him, it's a done deal. That's beautiful. That is awesome. You know what's so sad? When I first became a Christian, oh, Lord have mercy, I attended a church that all they taught was topical messages. All they did was just jump around the Bible. And I loved the pastor, and I loved the church, and I loved the people 
but I wasn't learning a lot. I wasn't growing a lot because the pastor just talked about whatever he wanted to talk about. And there was so much like this, oh, that I would have benefited from if the pastor would have taken the time to teach salvation and the assurance of salvation. You know what's so amazing? I'll tell you a quick story. So 18 years old, I, I started a, a job in aerospace, and I get saved at 18. And I'm a baby Christian. When I say baby, I don't know anything about God. I'm just learning, but I'm so excited. I'm taking my Bible to work, and I'm reading my Bible, and I'm a driver. All I'm doing is just picking up parts and dropping off parts, aerospace parts. And I'm learning, and I'm start, I found K-Wave back when. And I heard Chuck Smith, didn't know who he was, started listening. I heard Greg Laurie, I heard Raul Reese, and I'm soaking all these things up. And I'm growing, and I'm so excited, and I'm like learning more from the radio than I am at church. It was so sad. Well, a couple years go by. Still driving, and I'm still growing, but there's so much I don't know, and I'm struggling specifically in my salvation, and I'm wondering... That every time I sin, do I lose my salvation? Do I need to go back up to the front and cry out to God again and say the sinner's prayer again? And this was going on in my heart. I'm a young man. I'm struggling. And one day, it's amazing. I'm driving. And I get to a place where it's packed. And there's literally several trucks that are waiting to go in, drop off, and pick up. And so I'm there, and I, you know, turn the truck off, and I grab my Bible that's on my seat, and I'm sitting down just waiting for my turn. And all of a sudden, this guy in front of me, don't know him from Adam, gets out of his truck, and he walks over to me. And he says, hey, how you doing? Good. You know, I'm like 22, whatever, something like that. He's, you know, probably 50. I feel like he's an old guy. I'm 50, so I'm like, at that time, he was old. (laughs) And he says, what are you reading? And I says, oh, I'm reading my Bible. And he goes, wow, that's cool. And, uh, and we just start talking. And long story short, he says, what are you struggling with? And I said, I don't know, man. I don't even know. I don't know this guy from Adam. He could have been an angel for all I know. And I said, I don't know. I says, you know, I've been trying to serve God, but it just really bothers me. I'm just not confident in in my faith. And I wasn't in sin or anything crazy like that. I was just genuinely struggling because I'd never been taught God's word. He goes, hang on a minute. And he walked over to his truck and he came back with a book. And he goes, I'm going to give this book to you and I want you to read it. And the book was on Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Never seen the guy again. He gave me the book. I read it, was amazed by it, and then passed it on to someone else. But I never forget that because this is what it talked about. It talked about, again, that as Christians, if you truly are saved, then only you and God know, but if you truly are saved, you don't have to worry anymore because if God has declared you righteous, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. And every time God looks at us, He doesn't see Michael in his brokenness and Michael in his errors and Michael in his sin. He sees his son Jesus because I'm covered by the blood. I am covered with the righteousness of Christ. And this is so beautiful because this is what Paul is explaining. He's encouraging, again, the people. He's encouraging these young believers in Rome that if God has declared them righteous, what? They are righteous forever. They have eternal life, right? It's forever. And this is beautiful. That means if they are right with God, they are right with God forever, for all eternity. Isn't that comforting? Oh, thank you, Jesus, right? I don't have to fear, right? Every time I make a mistake, because you know what? I make mistakes, that I lost my salvation again. If you truly are saved, you can find comfort that if God has declared you righteous, you are righteous forever. Someone say amen to that. It's so important, guys. We'll keep reading. Here's the first benefit. Paul says, if you've done that, right, since you've done that, we now have what? Underline peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Beautiful. Benefit number one. We have peace with God. Now understand, prior to your salvation, you were a sinner. And you were living in sinful disobedience against God, which means your sinful actions made you an enemy of God. That's what the Bible declares. But now, because of Jesus, because our sins have been washed away, right? We are no longer enemies of God. We are now children of God. Someone say amen. Right? The war is over. Make sense? The war is over. We now enjoy peace with God. No longer as we are viewed as his enemies. Now think about it. Prior to Christ, did we have peace of mind? No. Did we have peace with our fellow man? No. Did we have peace with God? No. The Bible says, Isaiah 48, 22, there is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. That's why the wicked will never experience peace in this life. The world has always been looking for peace. Never find it as long as they live in wickedness. Isaiah 32, 17, the effect of the righteous or the effect of righteousness will be peace. That's what comes when we are made right with God, which explains why every believer having been declared right before God through faith should be experiencing peace. The charges against us have been dropped, right? Our sins have been washed away. We have received the forgiveness of sins, which, is mean, which means that one time, although God was against us, today God is for us. Someone say amen, right? That's what the Bible teaches. It is so beautiful. Isaiah 9, 6, Jesus is called the Prince of? If you've received the Prince of Peace, do you understand? You can have peace with God. That's what this is about. This is a beautiful benefit. Colossians 1.20 states that Jesus has made peace between God and men through the blood he shed on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. You should be experiencing peace with God today. Fellowship with God. Because, again, the barrier of sin that separated holy God from sinful man has been removed. Let's move on. Number two. Second thing. How about access to God? We have access to God. We should be walking, experiencing that access to God. Verse 2, through him. Who's the him? Jesus. Through Jesus, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Now, the word access, very simply, in Greek, it means the privilege to approach. I love that. It means the privilege to approach, and it describes being given the ability to come before a person of higher rank. That's what it means. It's beautiful. It's that picture, right, of being given access to come and approach and stand before the king. And we now have that through who? Through Jesus. He's able to take us by the hand. Isn't that beautiful? you imagine? You come before a king in the old days, and there's no way you could approach the king, but all of a sudden, the king's son comes and says, I can get you in. And he grabs you by the hand, and he takes you before his dad, and he says, Daddy, he wants to talk to you. Do you understand that beautiful picture? That's what Paul is describing here. Through Christ, through faith in him, we are given that grace. We are given that gift And what makes this even more incredible is you have to understand what this means. You know, today as believers, we are born after the cross, right? At the moment of salvation, you know, since then, we have had access to God every single day. But I wonder how many of us take that for granted. You see, understand, prior to Jesus, prior to the cross, the common Jew never had access to God like we do. Do you understand, if you know your Bible, that only one man, the high priest of Israel, was able to come into the presence of God? You know how often? Once a year, the Day of Atonement, for a few minutes. He had access to God one time a year for maybe less than an hour to come into God's presence. That's the way it worked. Every Jew understood this. No common Jew 
could ever do that. Only one man on all planet Earth was able to appear before God's presence. Why? Because if you remember, right, God's presence dwelt above the ark, right? And the ark was protected by a veil. Do you guys remember that? The veil separated the holy place from the holy of holies. But when Jesus died, Jesus did what? He tore the veil. He tore the veil. And it was a sign that that barrier was removed through the death of Jesus so that now anyone, anyone through him can come, enter into the presence of God and stand before him. Why? Because we have been declared right with God. We stand in grace. Isn't that beautiful? And we're able to stand there before God, not just once a year. How about every single day? Isn't that incredible? How many of us could have access today to walk into the Oval Office and stand before the president? Anyone do that? Well, we have an even greater access to stand before the Lord God Almighty. And that's why the, the writer of Hebrews tells us, Hebrews 4.16, Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. We have access if you have been declared right before God. Are you taking advantage of the access, right? You have that pass, right? That pass that gets you backstage. Are you using it? Because every Christian should. Let's move on. Number three, how about the hope of glory? How about the hope of glory? How many of us, Lord have mercy, our bodies are falling apart? <laughs> Keep reading. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now the word rejoice is an interesting word. It actually means to boast. That's what it means. To boast. We boast in hope of the glory of God. It says we celebrate it. We brag about it. We brag about the hope of glory. Now think about it. Prior to Jesus, did we have anything to brag about? No. We all fell short of the glory of God, right? We had nothing to brag about. But now, having received the righteousness of Christ, by grace through faith, we share in the hope of glory. All of us share in the hope of glory. Now get this, the word hope is defined as confident expectation. It does not mean wishful thinking. Oftentimes people think it means, oh, I hope, I hope, I hope that happens. That's not what hope means in the Bible. It means confident expectation. It speaks of something that is certain, but not yet realized. It's going to happen because if God says it, it's going to happen. And one day, every single believer, every single child of God is not only going to behold His glory, but we will share in His glory. Isn't that incredible? We're going to share in His glory. John, in 1 John 3, 2, says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, right? Because of Jesus, we're children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. How many of us wonder, what, is, what are we going to be like, right? When it's, when it's all said and done. We don't know yet. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, right? I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what the glorified body looks like. But I know that when he shows up, we're going to be just like him. We're going to be transformed. We're going to be made just like him, and we shall see him as he is. Now, I love this because I don't know about you, but I get tired of sinning. I get tired of messing up. I get tired, right? I do. I'm not perfect, guys. Forgive me. Your pastor is not perfect, okay? <laughs> but what's beautiful, what's beautiful is that everything that keeps us from being perfect is going to be gone. It's going to be gone one day. All these dumb struggles, right? These temptations, these trials, these issues, even our body breaking down is going to be gone one day when we share in the glory. And we have that hope today. Someone say amen, right? Very, very important. But notice, keep reading verse 3. Not only that, right? Paul goes on, right? I love Paul. He's all, but there's more, right? 
but we rejoice in our sufferings. Now, that's interesting. Remember, the word rejoice means to boast in. When's the last time you bragged about your sufferings? Because that's what Paul said. You see, get this. Because all believers have the hope of glory, despite our sufferings, we can still rejoice, can't we? Because we have hope. We know that regardless of what we go through, it doesn't matter. Nothing's going to stand in the way of the glory that is to come. So that even when we go through suffering, we can have hope still. Why? Because God is in control. Someone say amen, right? Because God's in control. And we know, we can trust that if God is allowing us to suffer, there must be a reason. Does God know what he's doing? Again, we scratch our head. We wonder why, right? God allows difficulty and struggle in our life. But Paul says we can rejoice about it because somehow God is working it out for our good, right? God knows what he is doing. Now, interesting, the word suffering in the Greek actually means pressure. That's what it means, pressure. Suffering means pressure. And it was a word used to describe the pressure that was applied to olives to produce olive oil. It's pressure. And sometimes as we go through our sufferings, we feel that pressure, don't we? This is what Paul is describing. But again, it doesn't matter because what Satan might mean for bad, God can what? He can use for good. And he can use our suffering so that our trials, although they were meant to work against us, our trials can work for us. Because we all know the saying, right? What doesn't kill us makes us stronger. That's what our trials are meant to do. And that's what Paul continues to explain He says, knowing, look back, that our suffering produces endurance. As we suffer, you know what happens? We get stronger. Think about a a marathon runner. The more that runner runs, he suffers pain. I have to believe, right? 26.2 miles, got to be pretty painful. But the more he runs, she, the more she runs every single day, right? Causing their muscles to ache, causing their bodies to experience suffering. What happens? The stronger they get. And as they endure that suffering, they grow stronger. And they're able to run longer. And they're able to run farther. And this is what happens. Without giving up. Do you understand, and I say this all the time, Lord, have mercy, this world is getting worse. Things are going to get worse. And we need to grow. Sadly, we don't grow when everything is kumbaya. Isn't that right? We don't grow like that. We grow when we go through trials and when we suffer. That's how we are made stronger. And God is allowing these things to happen today because He knows things are going to get worse, guys. This is where we need to grow. This is where we need to use our spiritual muscles so that we can grow in endurance so that we will not give up and we will not give in. Keep reading verse 6. And endurance produces character. Now this is interesting. The word character in Greek is the word proof. Something that is proven. And notice what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that as we suffer, we grow in our endurance to keep going, to keep serving Jesus, right? And the more we grow in our maturity, in our strength, the more it proves that we truly are children of God. When trials hit and we go back to the world, that doesn't prove that we were children of God, right? But when we continue to keep on keeping on despite what we face. We not only grow, but we prove like silver or gold that is tested in the fire that we truly are genuine, right? That we truly are children of God. I know none of us, me included, like to go through trials But when we understand the purpose of trials, when we understand how God is allowing them in our life for a reason, we can rejoice in them, right? 
God, I don't know, but I trust that you know that this is what I need. And so, you know what? Praise the Lord, right? Praise the Lord for our trials. This is what James said. You guys might remember. Uh, actually, I skipped the verse. Forgive me. 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul says, All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's just part of it, right? And then James says, James 1, 2, and 4, Consider or count it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face the trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. It's endurance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may grow and become mature and complete, lacking nothing. We can rejoice even in our suffering. Why? Because we have the hope of glory. Because we know that God knows what he's doing. And keep reading. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. What's so beautiful is that as we go through trials, and as we are made stronger in our trials, which prove that we truly are children of God, it just strengthens our hope, because we know we're genuine, and we truly have the glory of God to look forward to. Does that make sense? That's what Paul said. It's so beautiful, it's so simple, and it's incredible. Let's keep moving on. Number four, we should be experiencing the love of God. We should be experiencing the love of God in our life. Again, keep reading verse 5. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now, the word love here is the word agape, and we've heard that word before. It's the Greek word agape. Remember, in Greek, there are several words for love. This specifically is agape. It's, it's the love of God. It's love that is unconditional. And Paul reminds us, right, that we can have this hope of glory. Why? Because God has poured His love into our hearts, when did God do this? Well, He did it at the moment of salvation when He filled us with His Spirit. Isn't God love? God is love, right? He's filled us with the Holy Spirit, right? Which shares with us the love of God, right? The love that comes from God. Now, what's incredible about this, again, write this down if you're taking notes, Ephesians 4.30. In Ephesians 4.30, Paul states that the Holy Spirit was a down payment. Do you guys know that? Holy Spirit was a down payment. What are you talking about? Well, God gave us His Holy Spirit as a down payment that we truly are His and that we truly are saved, and it's a down payment that everything He's promised us, including heaven, is to come. This is how God has demonstrated, right, His love. And this is why Paul said in Romans 8, 16, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's one of the roles of God's Spirit that we would know as we walk with Him, right? As, as God speaks to us through His Word, by His Spirit, we are reminded of God's love for us, how much God loves us. And again, if you truly are saved, you should be experiencing this, having the Holy Spirit inside you, which assures you daily, right, as you are in the Word, as you are spending time with God in prayer, that God loves you. And I think that's something every single believer needs to be reminded of. Look what Paul goes on to do in verse 6. For a while, we were still weak. It's the word helpless. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Do you understand we were ungodly? Verse 7. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I love this passage. It's beautiful because Paul just told us how much God loves us and that he continually pours his love into us through his Holy Spirit. And then he says, do you know how much God loves us? Do you know how amazing God's love is? That God demonstrated his love to us when we were helpless. 
weak, right? When we were ungodly. Notice how Paul describes this. It's not very flattering. You guys notice that? We were weak, we were helpless, we were ungodly. And then he says, verse 8, we were sinners. Now Paul says, you know what's interesting? People might die for someone. How many of us would die for our kids, right? Oh, we get that, okay. For someone that is good to us, for someone, again, that, that we love, that, that is right with us, right? Maybe you would do that. Maybe people would do that. Okay, that's what Paul says. I'll give you that, right? Maybe someone would offer their life to, uh, you know, to save the president or something like that. That's what Paul says. But that's because in their eyes, that person is worthy of it. But Paul says, you know what God did? God gave his son who was good to die for people that are unworthy, that are ungodly, that are helpless, worthless sinners. That's what God did. That's how amazing God's love is. He didn't die for someone who was worthy. He died for the undeserving. He died for us. Can you imagine that God gave his perfect and holy and good and righteous son to die for ungodly, worthless sinners? That's how amazing God's love is. And again, this is what Paul describes. Now, what's interesting about this is this tells us something, right? This tells us that the love of God, that agape love, is not motivated by the worthiness of the recipient. Does that make sense? It has nothing to do whether that recipient is wonderful or not. This is all about love because God simply is loving, right? God gives his love not because we are worthy, not because we are deserving, because we're not. We're sinners. God extends his love simply because God is good, right? Simply because God is loving. And what's awesome, even more, if you want to take that a step further, that tells us that today... Does God's love change when we're good Christian boys or bad Christian boys? If we get up one day and we we do our Bible study and we spend five hours in prayer, right? Does God love us more on that day than on the day that we don't? No. God's love is not based upon us. God's love is based upon Him. And that is so incredible, right? We can know that even on our bad days, because we all have them, God still loves us, okay? God still loves us. Let's keep going. Number five. How about deliverance from wrath, okay? How many of you are thankful to God that even today, even before, right, we get to heaven, we can experience deliverance from wrath? Verse nine. Since, therefore, we have been justified by his blood, of course, the blood of Jesus, How much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? Now again, he's already demonstrated, right? God demonstrated his love in sending his son to die for hopeless, helpless sinners. Now if God sent his son to save us from hell, how much more do you think he will save us from wrath on earth? Make sense? If God went through all the trouble to send his son to save us from the judgment to come of hell, don't you believe God will also save us today on earth from the wrath to come? Now, what wrath is he talking about? Isn't there a coming judgment coming? How many of you read the book of Revelation? We have a seven-year tribulation coming. How many of you thank God that we're not going to be here? That's because of him. We don't have to fear, right? How many people live in fear of the future? We don't have to because we have deliverance from the wrath to come. Again, which is exactly what Paul says, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. It can't be any more simpler than that, right? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We can read the Bible. You know, I remember talking to different people, and I've had people say, I I don't like reading the book of Revelation. I don't even want to read the book of Revelation because it's scary. I've had people, Christians tell me that. And I get it. Again, I'm not not making fun of them. I, I get it, right? But if you have the peace of God, right? 
if you know you're standing before God, if you know how much God loves you, and if you know that God has promised to deliver us from the wrath to come, how many of you know we can read the Revelation, book of Revelation, right? Knowing that we're going to be in heaven with our popcorn kind of just looking down at what's taking place on earth. Amen? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, how much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life? Now, I love this. Understand the word reconciled or reconciliation <coughs> excuse me, refers to the removal of enmity or hostility between two parties. Remember, our sin made us enemies with God. But now that the sin has been dealt with because of Christ, we now have fellowship with God. We have been reconciled to God, right? We now have peace with God. And so understand what Paul is saying. He says, for if we were enemies, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of Jesus, how much more, now that we are already reconciled to Jesus, shall we be saved by his life? Now, what's Paul saying? This is really cool. What is he saying? He says this. He says, if God saved us through the death of Christ, how much more shall we be kept saved by the life of Christ? Amen. Do you understand what he's saying? If Jesus' death is what saved us, how much more with Jesus? Is, is our God dead today? He's alive, right? Through his life shall we be kept saved. That's what he's telling us. He is bringing us, again, assurance of our salvation. Do you understand, even today, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's doing what? He's praying for us. He is making intercession for us today. Isn't that incredible? I thank God for every single one of you that pray for me, and please do it every day, right? But even more than that, Jesus is praying for me. He's praying for me. He's praying for me. If his death can save me, his life can keep me saved. And this is what, again, we find Hebrews 7, 24 and 25. Because Jesus lives forever. He has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely or save forever those who come to God through him, why? Because he always lives to intercede for them. Understand, guys, you don't have to walk in fear. You can have peace. You don't have to fear the future. Because if his death saved us, his life can keep us saved. Someone say amen to that? It's beautiful, right? Get excited about it. You need to be excited about it, all right? Amen. How about the last one and we're done? How about join the Lord? Can we have join the Lord today? Verse 11, last verse. More than that, right? I love Paul. I love his words, right? After everything I've told you, even more than all that, he says, we also boast, right? We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you guys caught on to how many times he said through Jesus? Through whom we have now received reconciliation. We have peace, guys. We experience God's love. We need not fear anymore. We have been reconciled for God. Again, God is no longer against us. God is for us. And for that reason, right, despite the ups and downs, we can celebrate our salvation today. We can enjoy the relationship that we have with God today. Does that mean we're going to be exempt from trials? No. We're still going to go through hard times. I, I face trials every single day. I have my struggles, right? I experience my problems. We live in a fallen world, and we need to understand it just comes with the territory, okay? It just comes with the territory. 
but because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength, we can, we can have joy in God. And we can trust in Him. We can remind ourselves of all these things that are available to us through Jesus. And when we do that, you know what's so interesting? When we do that, we gain that proper perspective. You know, trials are, are terrible and no one likes to go through trials. But you know what? Every time I go through a trial, I get perspective. How many of us, we want to feel sorry for ourselves and we want to, woe is me. Think about people in other countries. Think about people that are starving. Think about people that don't even have shelter. Think about people with violent governments. I mean, the list goes on, right? And so when we go through these difficulties, as we all do, number one, we get perspective, right? Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm complaining over my knee, and there are people that can't even walk. Perspective. Perspective. But the other thing is, again, our trials strengthen us. Our trials strengthen us. And the last thing, if I can even add one more, not even in my notes, is that our trials make us look forward to going home. Right? They make us look forward to going home. And so thank you, God, for everything that comes with it, even the good and the bad, because if you know your God, you know that all things work together for our good and for his glory. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Again, Father, we thank you this morning, Lord God, for your love and, and for your goodness. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your precious word. Lord, remind us of these things. I think so often, Lord God, we become distracted by the things of this world, Lord God. We, we lose focus. And so thank you for your word. Thank you for this morning. Lord, you continue to speak to our hearts. And I pray we would examine our lives, Lord God. Are we experiencing these things in our life? Because you've made them available to us. Your desire, Lord, is that we would be fulfilled, that we would live a life a purpose, Lord God, that we truly would be seeking first the kingdom. And as we do, Lord God, we can rest assured that you're working all things out for our good, Lord. Thank you for who you are. I pray, Lord, for anyone this morning, Lord God, maybe without peace, maybe without hope, speak to their heart. Help them to know, Lord God, that you're waiting with open arms for them to come to you, desiring that they would turn from their sin and turn to you. And if they would be willing to do that, if they would be willing, again, to put their faith in Jesus, to trust in who he is and everything that he has done for them, Lord, you will receive them, Lord. You will cause them to become children of God, that they too can experience all of these blessings that you desire for all of your children. Lord, we love you. We thank you again. And as always, we're careful to give you the glory you alone deserve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand, guys.